Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 9340 in the name of Liz Smith on prioritising Scottish tourism. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Liz Smith to move the motion up to seven minutes, please, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We are remarkably privileged to live amongst the landscapes of Scotland. The beauty of our dramatic scenery, the rich diversity of our cultures, our history and our ancient monuments and our sporting attractions are just some of the reasons why visitors want to come here. Yes, it's true that visitors can also encounter some difficulties with the weather, usually, and the perennial challenges of our midges, midges. but tourism is in our DNA. The sector is not only essential to our global appeal, but it is the prerequisite for rebuilding our economy and stimulating economic growth. And how much we desperately need that growth, given the Scottish Government's current balance sheet that the Finance Committee was scrutinising yesterday. And we should never forget that the overwhelming number of tourism enterprises are small businesses, just like the Real Food Cafe in Tyndrum, whose owner was in touch with me this morning about the Hospitality Unlimited project. Small businesses which are always the backbone of any economy, 96% of the sector according to the most recent statistics. But make no mistake, this sector feels so badly let down because of the Scottish Government's failure to prioritise its needs most especially in the rural and island areas. Mark Crothall said a couple of months ago that the industry is experiencing the double whammy from inflation and policy pain that is adding costs which would put many out of businesses altogether. And he went on, and I quote, this is entirely the wrong time for the Scottish Government to be piloting policies that will do limited good and risk maximum harm. And just at the weekend in the Herald, the owner of a self-catering cottage in the Western Isles, previously an SNP member apparently, denounced what he described as the perfect storm of SNP policies that could potentially mirror the demographic consequences of the clearances. Yes, I will. Keith Bryan. Liz, can I thank Liz Smith for taking intervention. She's listed a number of things in her motion which she says are down to the SNP. In that list, is she any space for the energy costs, the interest rate rises, the inflation or the effects of Brexit, or do those not matter? Liz Smith. I think, Mr Brown, I'm on record in this chamber of having spoken several times about the effect of Brexit and the difficulties of the Labour spy, but I am not going to take any lectures from a Scottish Government which refuses to address the fact within the healthy increase in migration to the UK, Scotland is hardly seeing any benefit, which begs the question as why people won't come here in the first place. So let's examine the elements of that perfect storm, and I want to start with infrastructure. The CalMac ferry disruptions and subsequent cancellations have caused between 30 and 50 per cent reductions in accommodation bookings for most of our islands. Whether it's communities in Mull and Iona, Arran, Lewis, Harris, South Uist, the list goes on. Ferry disruption has played a major part in disrupting the tourist industry, which I am sure is exactly why Alistair Allen was quite rightly questioning the First Minister just last week about the serious implications of these cancellations. And there were demonstrations at Loch Boysdale just this weekend. Business leaders furious that there will be no compensation for the Scottish Government for all the disruption. And then there are the significant issues of the A9 and the A96 and the broken promises regarding the duelling of these critical road networks. Already the subject of so many debates and questions in this chamber. Now I'm not sure where Richard Lockhead is today, but if he wants to hear it first hand, what the long-term effects are of this, he doesn't just have to listen to my Conservative colleagues who have been assiduous in highlighting the dangers of this issue for many months, perhaps years, but also to his own constituents, Highland Council, Transport Scotland, and of course his own colleagues, Fergus Ewing and Emma Roddick, who know exactly what the effects are, not just on safety, but on tourism across the whole of the Highland region. Other countries don't have to put up with this blight on our infrastructure and connectivity, and it's high time that the SNP Green Government recognise just how damaging the effects have been. But it's not just the weak infrastructure and connectivity that are causing problems. A third of Scottish Tourism Alliance representatives cited the short-term let licensing policy as the biggest challenge. They have criticised the SNP Greens for failing to recognise the knock-on effects of self-caterers giving up their properties and leaving them lying empty, on local employment, on the sustainability of small rural communities, and in Edinburgh, where there are eye-watering fees being charged ahead of the festival and fringe, undermining the availability of accommodation. 
And all this when businesses are having to cope with inflation, high energy costs and the fallout from the Scottish Government's chaotic deposit return scheme. The Short Term Accommodation Association said that the introduction of the scheme could have lasting and damaging effects on Scotland's tourism economy. And then on top of that, local authorities will have the power to introduce a visitor levy. UK Hospitality Scotland said that the introduction of the visitor levy will leave so many hospitality businesses frustrated yet again by other costs that will come on a sector that is so in difficulty. I won't if you don't mind just now. Making Scotland uncompetitive in relation to the rest of the UK. Something we already know that is happening with general taxation. Fiona Campbell of the Association of Scotland Self-Caterers condemned the visitor levy at a time when the sector was already being hit by what she described as a juggernaut of regulation. And it is that combination of regulation and red tape, of increased costs and the failure of the Scottish Government to match the 75% business rates relief that was awarded in the rest of the UK, despite having the Barnet consequentials to do so. That is why it's causing so much concern. And we know too that along with several other sectors, tourism has made its views very well known about the general anti-business agenda of the SNP and Greens, although I do think the current minister is trying to address something. The Chambers of Commerce warning that the combined effects was that Scotland would become a less attractive place in which to live and work. And I think the minister would be well advised to listen to the concerns of the Economy Committee, which wrote to the Scottish Government during the pre-budget process, saying that tourism has obviously suffered a cut in cash terms of 51.2 million down to 49.4. At the very time when many new tourism enterprises in Scotland have the lowest survival rate. Presiding officer, I return to my original point, namely that a strong tourism sector should be at the heart of Scotland's DNA. But with this Scottish Government, that is very far from the, from the case. Now, I know Richard Lockhead likes to tell us that he is the Minister for Tourism, but the sector, the sector feels otherwise perplexed that this role has been subsumed into the more general portfolio of small business and innovation. So can I finish by calling on the Scottish Government to look at this whole issue again. It needs a blueprint to address deep-seated concerns, and I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Ms Smith. I now call on Neil Gray, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to a move amendment at 9340.2. Up to six minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. Presiding Officer, as Cabinet Secretary for a Wellbeing Economy and a proud Arcadian, I simply do not recognise the picture that uh, the Conservatives through Lyd Smith have attempted to paint of Scottish tourism just now. The Government's track record on tourism have, is one of unwavering support, and rightly so, as tourism is a jewel in the crown of Scotland's economy, driving growth, creating employment and showcasing the beauty of our nation, as Lyd Smith rightly outlined at the start of her speech, our history, our culture uh, to the rest of the world. I assure you our government recognises its significance and remains committed to supporting and fostering its success. And first, let me address that uh, uh, claim at the end of Liz Smith's speech that the SNP Green government lacks a de dedicated tourism minister. While uh, ministerial titles change, uh, our responsibilities are absolutely set. And placing tourism at the heart of the responsibility of the Minister for Small Business, Liz Smith herself recognised that the majority of tourism businesses are themselves small business. Uh, small businesses, demonstrates and strengthens its position rather than diminishes it. I will give way briefly. L Liz Smith. Can I just ask uh, why it is that the um, tourist sector itself is complaining and feeling perplexed that there is not a dedicated minister? Yeah. I have spoken regularly to Mark Crothall and others within the sector about and re reassured them. And I think the engagements that uh, uh, Richard Lockhead has engaged upon uh, since he has been appointed would, seek, would, would confirm that reassurance. But it is not just Richard Le uh, Lockhead that is leading so energetically as he is uh, on this front. Other ministers across uh, government are engaged in tourism matters, myself included within Cabinet, pooling our expertise and resource to drive the industry forward. All signs suggest this approach 
is working. The most recent figures from the Office of National Statistics released just last week show that there were 3.2 million visits to Scotland from overseas visitors last year, compared to 3.46 million visits over the same period in 2019. This recovery of demand uh, pace, uh, outpaces uh, the rest of the UK, where the comparable figure uh, remained 25 per cent below 29 uh, figures, 2019 figures. Let me repeat that, as I think it confirms the strength of our approach here in Scotland. Recovery elsewhere in the UK in 2022, 25% below 2019, against us at 7% below here. Furthermore, these figures show that spending from overseas visitors in Scotland has recovered to pre-pandemic levels already, with the sector seeing spend of £3.2 billion in 2022, up 24% in nominal terms on pre-pandemic levels. This is important, as our tourism strategy Outlook 2030 is focused on tourism as a force for good, with visitors who linger longer, contribute more, and our strategy has social, economic and environmental sustainability at its core. There are also promising I'm really sorry, but time is tight this afternoon, uh, Mr. Fraser. There are also promising signs that 2023 will be another great year for Scottish tourism, with numerous businesses already witnessing strong bookings, increased investment flowing to the sector, the introduction of our new direct air routes and a lineup of unmissable events such as the highly anticipated uh, World Cycling Championships. All indications point to another successful year ahead for Scotland's vibrant tourism industry. But we are not complacent and keeping pedalling hard for success with the tourism industry for the people and businesses involved and its contribution to the economic growth here in Scotland. Championing a vibrant tourism sector is at the heart of our national tourism strategy, which remains highly relevant and influential even after the experiences of the last three years. This strategy was developed through close collaboration with the sector, ensuring it reflects our shared ambition to position Scotland as a global leader in 21st century tourism. Uh, to drive this vision forward, we have established the Tourism and Hospitality Industry Leadership Group. And the purpose of this group is to provide strategic direction, ensure the successful implementation of Scotland Outlook 2030. And under the co-chairmanship of the Minister, Richard Lockhead, the tourism, Scottish Tourism Alliance Chief Executive, Mark Crothall, the ILG acts as a unifying force, guiding the industry forward uh, towards recovery, sustainable growth uh, and excellence, ensuring that the tourism industry is at the forefront of our well-being uh, economy. But of course, that said, many of the most pressing challenges facing the sector lie out with the powers available to us. Keith Brown made a very salient uh, intervention. An, indif uh, an industry survey published uh, in 2019, uh, on the 29th of May, shows that high energy costs, the need to cut VAT, the impact of high inflation and the impact of Brexit on labour shortages are all key issues facing the sector. That's the industry saying it for themselves. So we continue to call on the UK Government to use its reserve powers in a manner that supports rather than hampers Scottish tourism. I'm really sorry, I'm in my final minute to conclude. And in conclusion, I strongly reject the opposition's claim that this Government is doing anything other than supporting our Scottish tourism industry. Of course there are challenges, and not least the ferry maintenance, which I absolutely recognise. But our Government has consistently prioritised the tourism sector, recognising the importance of tourism to our economy and the well-being of our communities, making strategic investments in marketing, infrastructure and workforce. We have listened to the concerns of residents, businesses and industry experts, and we have taken decisive steps to address them. We have seen positive results with increased visitor numbers, economic growth, benefits for communities and enhanced international reputation. We are actively engaged in fostering the growth and success of the sector and will continue to work with them to part the, and our partners to develop a comprehensive blueprint for the future, ensuring that Scotland remains an attractive, welcoming prosperous destination from visitors around the world and realising our shared ambition to confirm Scotland as a world leader in 21st century tourism. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call on Daniel Johnson to speak to and to move Amendment 9340.1. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in my name. And can I begin by thanking Liz Smith and the Conservatives for bringing this motion, because I think it is critically important. Tourism is a hugely important uh, industry for this whole of this uh, country. And I think its impacts go far beyond the simple revenues and kind of narrow economic analysis 
uh, that one might uh, initially uh, look to. But I would just say uh, to, to the Minister, I don't think this needs to be a contentious debate, because I do think that Liz Smith brings up a number of points which are important to the industry, do need to be resolved, and even if you don't necessarily accept the entire characterisation, I think there are substantive points, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't, but I do think they need to be addressed. And that's very much the tenor I'm going to speak to in this debate. Um, uh, and I think actually ultimately, and I wasn't going to comment on this, in terms of a dedicated minister, I think names do matter. I think having tourism included in, in the name, I think does get, and I, it may seem superficial, but I think actually it does at least send a signal to the industries. So I would just say that very gently. But overall, the reason I think this is so important is because I believe that we have a, 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 a really distinctive and unique advantage in Scotland in terms of our brand, brand Scotland. We have an asset in this country in terms of its geography, its people, our culture, and that in terms of tourism is what draws here, but it's actually much part of something much larger. We have a reputation and renown around the world that doesn't just draw tourists, but I think means that we, we don't need to introduce ourselves. People know Scotland. Uh, they, they understand the things that have come here. People are always interested when you say you're from Scotland. We have produce and pro, uh, uh, provenance that are, is the envy of other countries. But I think what we lack is the sort of the coherence of bringing that together, which I think other countries have done more successfully. And I think we all collectively need to focus on, you know, where there's Ireland to California, that, that combination of place, produce, reputation, people and culture. From France to Tuscany, I think places like that are what we need to emulate and seek to copy here, because I think we can. We have the elements, and not only will that benefit tourism, but I think the tourism itself will act as a calling card for all our other economic interests. But make no doubt, in itself, tourism is a vital uh, element of our economy. You, you only have to look around the streets of Edinburgh now just to see the vibrancy and indeed the revenue that tourism brings. It's vitally important. 209,000 employees, 8% of employment in Scotland. Uh, 479,000 visits. And let's not also forget that that's not just about international tourism, it's domestic United Kingdom tourism. 13.6 million uh, uh, overnight stays from within the United Kingdom, 60 million day visits. This is all vital elements of our tourist economy. But we do need to concentrate on supporting the industry. This is an industry hugely impacted by COVID. I think many uh, business owners were worried genuinely about whether they could survive to only be hit by a cost of living crisis. And the way I've been putting this is that, frankly, anyone running a kitchen is facing a huge, huge barrier to the continued viability of their business. Bills increasing uh, you know, five, six, sevenfold. And even despite the more recent declines, the, the, the fact that, that as a, a fixed cost to those businesses, utilities have gone from mere uh, percentage point or, or a few to sort of 10, 20 percent, that is unsustainable for many businesses. But we also do need to look at, at specific policy measures. I think we need to revisit non-domestic rates. The reality is for hospitality businesses that, that uh, non-domestic rates act as a disincentive for investment. We need to address that. I understand uh, Liz Smith's concerns about the visitor levy. I disagree. I never noticed paying it. But what we do need to make sure is those monies are reinvested in the quality and fabric of our uh, uh, tourist uh, centres. Um, uh, uh, and likewise, I think we do need to urgently revisit the short-term let issue. Now, I supported tackling the numbers. In my constituency alone, Airbnb registrations numbered some 3% uh, of all uh, addresses. But what we was brought in was a burdensome, I think unnecessary, regulation of something that wasn't a problem. Licensing wasn't tackling the number. It was tackling standards in short-term lets. No one was talking about that before. It was unnecessary legislation where the tail ended up wagging the dog. And I believe my colleague Jackie Bailey will address that further. But ultimately, I think the points that Liz Smith raised around transport are vital. Because people can come here, but if they can't get to the other parts of the countries, if they can't get to the islands because the ferries aren't running, if they can't get up the road because the roads aren't adequate, if the trains aren't frequent enough to take them, if the air routes aren't there to take them here, and let's while there's been some improvement, Glasgow is still significantly down in intercontinental uh, routes, then, frankly, uh, our tourism will struggle. So I very much support this motion uh, I, 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 and this debate today. 
but we need to help the tourist industry and help it embrace the future, and, and that's what my amendment seeks to talk about. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Rennie. That was quite an impressive um, all-round tour of the various issues of the uh, tourism industry, if I, if I must say. Daniel Johnson's contribution, I think, was the tenor in which we should try and uh, approach this debate, because there are some successes, there's no doubt, but there are some really big challenges, and there's lessons for the Scottish Government, as well as lessons for the UK Government. So I'm going to cover some of those. But first of all, I just want to pay tribute to those who are in the tourism sector. It has evolved dramatically over recent decades, you know, from the castles, the golf, distilleries, the festivals, now to like food towns and book towns, the long distance travel routes, the conference tourism that has really uh, taken off, the film locations in places like Falkland and my constituency with the Outlander tour, mountain biking, which I visited uh, the Mountain Bike World Cup, I visited in Fort William. Uh, last week, thank goodness I'm not doing that kind of sport. Um, but it was really impressive, and I'm looking forward to the World Championships that are coming that I think will show off all the different parts uh, of Scotland. The cruise ships dramatically changed the nature of the tourism offer that we've got, businesses cropping up in order to meet that demand. Um, the new venues like the V&A, but also the National Tapestry that I visited uh, down in Gala Shields uh, just last week. All of these things, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I've only got a short time. Um, all of these things are fantastic. And it's a great tribute to those, the entrepreneurs in the sector. They're great assets. But sometimes the government isn't really helping. I'm afraid on the ferries, it's been utterly devastating. And I want to give credit to the government with the road equivalent tariff, because when I visited the Western Isles, I could see for myself the real benefit that it had brought to the islands. All of that, they've been walloped. I mean, their business has been decimated. You saw the anger at Loch Boylesdale at the weekend, where effectively their business for June has just evaporated. And it's a terrible treatment for a quite a fragile community. I've only got, I'm sorry, I've only got a short minute of time. It's a very fragile um, community, and the government have really got to understand, and we'll cover this a bit tomorrow, they need to come up with a compensation, or we're just going to wipe away all the gains that the islands have had with the RET. Historic Scotland, why it's taking so long to do the surveys of the buildings to get these great assets opened up again is beyond me. I cannot understand. I know the arguments. I know we need to put safety first. But this has taken so long to get sorted. The A9, the A96, it's an insult to the Highlands. They've been promised this repeatedly for decades, and we've still not got there. So we need to sort that. Toilets. Toilets are really important. They're really undervalued. Our big survey at the New Year. In 2007, there were 521 public toilets. I was devastated to hear that's dropped to 355 last year. You can just imagine what these elderly tourists are feeling like. They're bursting to get the toilet and it's closed because the government have not funded local government sufficiently to keep these buildings open. But things like the North Coast 500 route, great development, fantastic development. But the state of the roads, the lack of public toilets, but also the lack of camping sites. The locals feel really irritated by it. Of course, they welcome the economic boost, but the fact that the government haven't really matched that with the resources. So all of this, tremendous potential, but the government haven't really matched it with the appropriate support. I've got um, concerns about short-term lets like Daniel Johnson's had. I have a nuanced position on the visitor levy, but there is a lesson from the Conservative government. They can't really complain about difficult economic conditions then allow Liz Truss to be in charge of the budget and also to have a really damaging Brexit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And I'm reminding all members they need to press the request to speak button in order to be called to speak. And on that note, I call uh, Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Keith Brown. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I draw members to my register of interest as a director of a small hospitality business in the borders. Every year, we hear the SNP promise improved relationships with Scotland's business community, a great reset of government economic policy, but it goes nowhere. Sturgeon, Yusuf, 
the SNP pursue the same anti-business agenda. If the SNP value Scottish tourism and all the jobs that the business it supports, they have a very funny way of showing it. They're making Scottish tourism businesses pay more tax than those south of the border. They're introducing more red tape, yep. more regulation. They're even making it harder for tourists to visit parts of Scotland by leaving major roads uninvested. The borders, the northeast, we've heard about it. No investment, island communities without ferries. And beyond the purchase of a camper van, the SNP have done very little for Scottish tourism. <laughs> they didn't even use the camper van. Perhaps the Greens fancy a trip, a one-way trip in the camper van. As The Economist said, the country's political class has been on a long holiday, but not in a camper van, clearly. On the camper van? <laughs> not just now, thank you. In the past, we could address some of those concerns to the Scottish Government Minister for Tourism. Now there is no such post. It's been demoted to a small footnote at the end of somebody else's responsibilities. Therefore, it's somebody else's problem. No thanks. It is disappointing approach because tourism is an integral part of Scotland's economy. And before COVID hit, the, the tourism sector accounted for one in every 11 jobs. And it's jobs like these that are really important to rural communities, such as my constituency in the border. And it was a pleasure to visit uh, an agritourism business, Ben Ken Farm, on Monday, where they are diversifying, they're developing their farm cottages, they are employing people, they are giving walking trails to, local pe to people who are visiting the area. And also I visited the River Tweed Commission where, of course, we know how important um, salmon fishing is to um, the River Tweed. And, and one of the employees said that Kelso is to salmon angling what St Andrews is to golf. And whether it's the river, a farm, a natural asset, these fantastic events, attractions, and natural assets are so important to rural areas. But the tourism sector is succeeding on its own. Um, they're succeeding in spite of this SNP government. While enterprises elsewhere in the UK benefit from 75% rate relief, the SNP choose not to match those for Scottish businesses. Whilst other governments try to attract visitors, the SNP want to bring in a tourism tax to hike the price of accommodation during a cost of living crisis. While Scotland's tourism industry gets back on its feet after COVID, the SNP brought in harmful short-term let's legislation. Yes. Well, the member's got uh, 50 seconds left, so we have to be very brief and a very brief response. Ms Hamilton, please continue. Thank, I thank you. Uh, so it is another SNP policy that, according to the Sto Scottish Tourism Alliance, will do limited good and risk maximum harm. The SNP will drive tourists and jobs they support away from Scotland with their hardline anti-business agenda. Presiding officer... The government needs to stop talking about a reset with Scottish businesses and get on with it. They can begin by abandoning short-term let legislation, scrapping the tourism tax, providing Scottish businesses with the same support as elsewhere in the rest of the UK, ditching the independence minister, bringing in a tourism minister, yeah, yeah, yeah. and bringing forward an urgent blueprint to support Scotland's tourism sector. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call Keith Brown to be followed by Carol Mockin. Mr Brown. Thank you, President Officer. I was delighted to see that tourism was to be discussed uh, in the Chamber, and then I saw the motion. Uh, a misleading attempt to score political points to the expense of one of Scotland's most important industry sectors starts off with a false assertion, continues to cherry-pick problems and pretend that there can be simplistic solutions to complex issues. Worse still, of course, what we've heard, trying to ignore energy bills, trying to ignore interest rates, trying to ignore the impact of inflation, trying to ignore... Sorry, I thought it was an, inter was that an intervention. Yeah. On you go. Uh, Jimmy Hulker johnson I thank the member for taking the intervention. How important does he think that the uh, ferries are for our island communities and other rural communities? And does he take responsibility for his government's utter failure to deliver those and the impact they're having on our sectors? Keith Bryan. Well, I would say I'm not in the government, but two words, Chris Grayling, £14 million to the ferry company that had no ferries. Or the fact that in the Isles of Scilly, or the fact that in the Isles of Scilly, the, the Tory party... No, no, no more into it. It's only got four minutes. 
In Ayrs or Silly, two years ago, the Tories promised to improve the ferry service they have not put a tender out so far. But trying to ignore the real impact of energy costs, interest rates, inflation, Brexit on the tourism industry, that is your real anti-business hardline agenda that has been spoken about before. In my constituency, the Stirling and Clipmanshire City deal will see the Scottish Government invest £15 million to enhance the cultural heritage and tourism offering, aiming to attract even more people from across Scotland, as well as the UK and the world to a spectacular region. Now, of course, the tourism strategy from the Scottish Government was laid out in March 2020. March 2020, the month that the pandemic hit really hard. Now, I heard Steve Barclay, the English NHS Minister, on this morning saying that the huge waiting queues in the NHS in England were due to the pandemic, which affected every administration around the world. We hear no mention of that from the Conservatives. This is not a serious motion about the tourism industry in Scotland. The figures show, though, that the sector is recovering and recovering well, returning to the positive growth figures that we were seeing pre-pandemic. The Scottish Quarterly GDP Index for Sustainable Tourism, which plummeted during the pandemic, is now back to pre-pandemic uh, levels uh, and uh, is now moving on an upward trajectory. And indeed, employment in the sector increased by 10.6 per cent over the latest year. And it's worth mentioning employment because we used to get a monthly bulletin from Murdo Fraser celebrating every time the UK outperforms Scotland in terms of employment. He's not said a word for the last few years, uh, the last uh, few months, when Scotland has outperformed the UK in terms of employment, uh, economic activity and unemployment. So there is no room for complacency in relation to this, but there's no place as well for a doom-laden pronouncement. It's the usual Conservatives talking Scotland down. And in relation to the A9, the A9 was mentioned, of course, the first priority of the Tory party, as with the Labour party, certainly when I joined this parliament, was to vote... Was, was to vote for £500 million to be spent on the trams in Edinburgh. That was their priority, not the A9 or the A96, which this government has taken forward, which previous Labour and Tory governments left in the abysmal state that we inherited. I've said I'm not taking any more interventions. The fact is that some parts of that route prevent, present some severe uh, engineering challenges. Everyone knows that, especially those that use that. What's not been mentioned, of course, is the investment in the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, the Borders Rail, the longest rail extension in the UK for 100 years, uh, or also the Queen's Ferry Crossing, or, as was mentioned by Willie uh, Rennie, RET, which had a massive impact uh, in uh, parts of the country. So what the Tories should be facing up to is the fact that the two biggest ongoing barriers to growth for the tourism economy in Scotland are entirely of their making. The fallout from the failings of their disastrous economic policies, we heard about Liz Truss, uh, and also, of course, the effect of Scotland being dragged out of the EU against their wishes, ending freedom of movement, making it harder for visitors to come here and causing major employment headaches from many sectors, particularly, it has to be stressed, in the hospitality sector. So the Tories are the ones that are undermining the tourism industry in Scotland, and at least the motion that they proposed should have acknowledged that. Thank you, Mr Brown. I now call Carol Mockin to be followed by Edward Mountain. A tight four minutes, Ms Mockin. Thank you, President Officer. I wish to begin by recognising the serious shocks and challenges our tourism industry has and is having to overcome from the pandemic to the subsequent financial pressures. It has been an extremely tough time and we need to give the tourism sector the reassurance that it requires. President officer, I wish to look at the reality for many working in the tourism sector. It's one of low pay, inconvenient hours and poor conditions. Despite the efforts of some, such as Living Wage Scotland and many within the industry, the uncertainty that the pandemic brought will live long in the memory of those impacted. The abrupt end to employment, the living in fear about what, where the next pay packet may arrive and the concerns about whether food could be put on the table was too much for some. And understandably, we know that many did not return because often that sector feels a bit like that uh, all of the time. If we want a thriving tourism sector, we need to support a well-paid workforce and we need to value the skill and effort that so many put in to ensuring the sector continues to, to survive. I note in the Cabinet Secretary's self-congratulatory amendment today that he takes no responsibility for this, eh, this government's inaction in this area. He is right to attack the Tories for their reckless decision-making, their dismal management of the economy and their failure to address problems linked to labour shortages. However, the reality is that it is this government that has failed to connect our rural areas to our international and regional transport hubs and his government that has cut the budgets of local authorities, meaning it is increasingly challenging to invest in local sites that are of interest to Scots and tourists alike. Scotland's tourism sector has two governments, 
letting it down. A reckless Tory uh, one at Westminster, and I think often an incompetent SNP one here at Holyrood. Scotland needs change. I look to the historic uh, area of Ayrshire in my south of Scotland region and I look at the beaches, the castles and the museums and I love that Willie Rennie brought in some of the other aspects of tourism around food, culture, cycling. These places are loved and are visited by many but they are inaccessible to so many others because of the poor connectivity, transport links and the investment that is needed at local community levels. We are incredibly lucky to have so many historic sites, villages, towns and cities, a country with sites of interest in every co corner, which we do have a brand. We don't need to market that brand. It's, it's there. But we are falling short of the mark when it comes to supporting communities that support tourism, tourism offering strong career prospects in the sector and boosting that essential connectivity. Indeed, presiding officer, it would be remiss of me not to mention the importance of properly supporting our rural college sector to show that we do truly prioritise our rural tourism sector where much of the training for that sector takes place. Last month, I had the honour of visiting the Borders College Newton St Boswell campus, where I heard from the staff and the students alike expressing the se severe and desperate challenges facing the colleges, particularly in those rural areas who, combined with the challenges linked to labour shortage, the government's inaction when our tourism sector in the rural areas is crying out for skills really is apparent. These college sectors can help our rural areas boost our tourism sector. In concluding, presiding officer, it is right that we debate this topic this evening. And as I mentioned, I understand the Cabinet Secretary it's well to focus on the shocking policies and decisions of the Tory government at Westminster. There is no doubt that their, action, their actions are having a direct impact on our tourism sector. However, what this government consistently fails to recognise is its own role in challenges facing many sectors in Scotland. It's you failed to, to face conclude, local Ms. authorities. Malcolm. Scotland needs change. It needs change now. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much indeed. I now call Edward Mountain to be followed by Ivan McKee. Again, a tight four minutes, Mr Mountain. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And I'd like to declare at the beginning that my register of interest where I own a fishery or, or jointly own a fishery on the River Spey, which relies on tourism and cont contributes to the £20 million that's generated from fishing on Speyside alone. Now, Scotland's got a great story to tell when it comes to tourism. You know, we've got a sector that contributes £4.5 billion to our economy, accounts for one in 11 jobs, and sees visitors spend over a billion pounds on eating and drinking as well. That's the good news. And let me just point out that it would only be a fool that would kill the goose that lays the golden egg. And that's what we seem to be seeing this afternoon, and that is extremely dangerous. Because what we're hearing from industry is things are going badly wrong. We've heard from the Chief Executive of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, who says that the government policies will do limited good and risk maximum harm. Now, why would you do that? Why would anyone do that? Now, some of the failings that we've heard about this afternoon are quite interesting. We've talked about transport. And we've got some great destinations up in the Highlands and Islands, and we'd all love people to come and visit them, but they can't. Why can't they? Because there aren't any ferries, or the ferries are delayed, or they're broken down, or there's a booking chaos. And I'm really interested that Keith Brown sat at the back and made, wouldn't comment on the ferries. He was one of the people that yeah. contributed to the fact that 801 and 802 weren't delivered on time. And what Islanders would say, what, I will in a minute. What Islands would say to you, Mr Brown, is shame on you because they're losing out. Mr Brown, I'll give away to you. Keith Brown. Does he accept there's been more investment in ferries by this government than any previous government? And also the fact that the government, the government which he supports gave £14 million to a ferry company that had no ferries. Edward Mountain. What, what I will accept, presiding officer, is the last ferry, new ferry that was delivered to the Scottish ferry fleet was in 2015. For goodness sake, we're eight years on. We need some new ferries. Get on with it. You promised them us in 2016. Now, I know about businesses across the Highlands and Islands who are already cutting their commitments in 2024. About 10% of them are wondering whether they should still be in business. In fact, a lot of people are getting cancellations from repeat customers because they cannot be guaranteed that people will be able to arrive on time. What a sorry state of affairs that is. Now, we've also heard today briefly about the A9, and I'm not going to reiterate it, but I travel it twice a week. I come down here and I go back on it. 
And those tourists that use it to get around the highlands or up to the highlands will be as shocked as I am when you drive down it. Not only are the potholes in it, but the driving and the standard of the road is extremely poor. We were promised in 2007 we'd get an eight, new A9. It still hasn't been delivered. Now, the other issue I want to touch very briefly on, if I may, is short-term lets. Now, we've had discussion about short-term lets, and we've seen that this government is going to legislate on it. But I think it's a really bad idea in the Highlands and Islands because we rely on those short-term laps to get tourists up there, tourists who will come up and spend money in the local economy. And it is the local government who've been tasked with sorting out the licensing scheme. And they've only sorted out about a fifth of the applications that they've seen. Uh, and since March this year, some of the ones within Highland Council have been put on hold because it's too difficult to deliver. Well, if the Minister wants to stand up and tell me I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Stand up and tell me You're I'm wrong. Conclude, if not, Mr. I suggest uh, that... Oh, I'm in the last minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> so not only is there a problem with short-term lets, Minister, I'm happy to discuss this afterwards with you, is the fact that there is tourism tax being raised. Tourism tax will not work. Let me tell you, the reason why it works in Europe is because there's a less rate of VAT. So, presiding officer, in summary, what I'd like to say is to the government, please don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg, because that's exactly what you're doing at the moment. Thank you. I now call Ivan McKee to be followed by Maggie Chapman again, a tight four minutes. Mr. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm delighted to speak on this debate on the hugely important tourism sector. I think it's important to recognise that um, the sector effectively is part of Scotland's uh, export economy. Uh, it really places uh, Scotland's uh, uh, significance in the world and projects uh, our culture values and what we have to offer the world. And also is a huge contributor to inward investment and to exports across other sectors, not least, of course, our hugely vibrant food and drink sector. So the centrality of the sector to Scotland's economy is significant. And it's great to see the rebound of the sector um, post COVID uh, in, in a better shape than the sector across the rest of the UK. Um, and Willie Rennie's uh, world tour of, uh, of Scotland was very uh, uh, great to hear uh, those traditional and new offerings in the sector as it continues to, uh, to modernise. And I think at the heart of that success has been a government industry collaboration and partnership that stretches before my time as Minister back to, to Fergus Ewan and perhaps uh, b before that as well. And I pay tribute to Fergus for working with the sector to bring forward the Scotland Outlook 2030 strategy, uh, which is something the whole sector has coalesced behind. They talk about it relentlessly and everybody's focused on delivering all aspects of that for people, places, businesses and uh, memorable experiences. And the setup of the uh, Industry Leadership Group, and it's great to hear the government carrying on with that work, um, has allowed the sector to coalesce and take forward that strategy with some really serious thinking and work on how to, uh, how to deliver it into the future. I'm delighted that Fair Work is a huge part of that and the Unite Hospitality Union are part of the Industry Leadership Group and also Sustainability and Net Zero is an important part of uh, the work of the ILG as well. In fact, you can see within that sector um, uh, the, the, the work that's been taken forward to deliver our wellbeing economy ambitions uh, for the sector. Um, but it's also really important, so, so I think that pays, uh, the, the, it kind of gives a lie to the the comments in the Tory motion that the sector does not work with government and there is a very strong collaboration there. But of course it is hugely important that to deliver on that strategy going forward some more immediate challenges do need of course to be addressed. Some of these have been uh, spoken about already. Cost inflation um, and energy costs a consequence uh, directly of UK government policy. Labour shortage is largely a consequence of uh, Brexit and uh, the, the drying up of uh, that labour pool uh, and skills of course a central issue in the, the, the strategy for the sector. Regulation has been mentioned and it is hugely important and uh, part of uh, the work with the sector um, on the transient visitor levy. I think there is a real opportunity here to work closely with the sector at the outset to design something that works for the sector. And I, I, I know that the Minister Tom, Ar uh, Tom Arthur very much understands that and is involved in that and can really show how to do regulation well if we get that right. Um, I, I, and recognising that the value raised from uh, that, that tax has to be used to support the, the tourism sector with uh, with investment. Um, and I know that there are still wrinkles in the short-term let proposals. I know the government is working hard to iron out those anomalies. Um, just uh, one question for the government. I'm not frankly quite sure now where the new uh, deal business group subgroup on regulation interacts with the business regulation task force and interacts with Russell Griggs's regulation review group. So some clarity on how all of that knits together would be welcome. Um, investment in the sector uh, and infrastructure that supports it is hugely important, as we all know. 
um, and Keith Brown has given some examples of investments that have happened already on our rail and road network around the country. It's too easy to forget uh, things that have been done in the past. But of course, we can't get away from the fact that more does need to be done. Does need to be done. Um, road connectivity has been mentioned. That is hugely important. That that uh, that work on A9 and A96 is taken forward as soon as possible. International route connectivity is uh, is important, and I pay tribute to the work of Visit Scotland, SDI, and the sector. I had a great meeting last night with, with the airlines in this regard. More international routes are coming on stream, but more are, of course, required an investment in marketing spend to support the sector uh, internationally. Um, but, of course, it ha has to mention that reliability of connectivity is hugely important, particularly you to our to islands. Conclude, and I know the government will work hard to make sure that that, uh, that is addressed going forward, because the last thing we need is that unreliability leading to uh, tour operators delisting islands, which has been Thank you, Mr. McKee. Turning, you do turning away to, business. You do need to and I look conclude. forward I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Thank Christine you very much. Graham. A, a strict four minutes, I'm afraid, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This Tory motion is a highly principled one. Unfortunately, they are Tory principles. It represents an attempt to enforce redistribution, that is, redistribution from the poor to the rich, to ensure sustainability, that is, the sustaining of, that is, the sustaining of wealth and privilege, and to embed well-being that is the being and the doing well of corporations and elites. As usual, they have everything the wrong way round. The purpose of an economy, as the rest of us have realised, is to enable well-being, health, fair work, family life, a clean environment and the exchange of beneficial goods and services. It's only a few diehards who still indulge in possible fantasies of infinite growth on a finite planet. And for the Tories, it seems, tourism is nothing but another extractive industry a kind of machine through which landscapes, communities and ecosystems are chewed up to produce a dribble, or better, a torrent of profit for those who already own too much. But the purpose of tourism, from a human perspective, is to enable people to rest and relax, to explore this amazing planet and the extraordinary histories of its inhabitants, to learn about other cultures and their own, to exchange friendships, creative ideas and understandings, to live better, more gently upon our shared earth. Of course, that needs businesses to provide accommodation, catering and activities, to enable experiences and encounters for people living locally and those traveling from afar. And those businesses deserve support where they themselves are a part of the local community, acting to protect and enhance their natural and built environments encouraging the circulation of tourist income within the local economy, committed to fair work practices and offering affordable leisure opportunities to those who live and work nearby. I will. Uh, I, th Bob I think the member is making a point about balance in relation and sustainability in relation to tourism. Would that involve making sure that all employers in the tourism sector pay the, the real living wage and treat their employees well? And of course, if there's labour scarcity, Chapman. allowing Maggie our Chapman. asylum seekers Maggie to work Chapman. would be one thing they could also do. Mr Doris, resume your seat. Maggie Chapman. I absolutely agree with the sentiment that Bob Doris has expressed for both asylum seekers and the living wage for all employees. Good tourism is an enhancement to a local area, whether rural or urban, bringing a renewed appreciation of place, history and tradition, vibrant hospitality, retail and social initiatives, secure jobs and livelihoods and much needed income. That is why best practice in many of the world's most sought-after destinations is to permit a visitor levy. Barcelona has had one since 2012, attracting quality tourism, sustaining the city's budget and funding improvements to its infrastructure. Why do the Tories think that Scottish towns and cities and Scottish communities do not deserve the same? Do they have so little faith in our country that they don't think it's worth paying to visit? Those of us who are proud of Scotland, whether we grew up here or chose to make it our home, know why visitors come here. Yes, it's for the beauties of our landscape, where we have rescued it from the threats of fracking or theme parks. It's for the richness of our biodiversity, which would be all the richer for boulder rewilding. It's for the purity of our rivers and streams, which would be, would be cleaner and safer without the curse of broken glass. And it's for the opportunities to roam our countryside, which would be wider were it not for the grouse playgrounds of the rich. But it is also for our dynamic towns and cities, for what a young Kiwi visitor this week called the vibe of the place, for the sense of a Scotland making its own way, learning from the best of progressive nations around the world, 
opening its doors and its hearts in welcome, especially to those who are not welcomed elsewhere. There is a road that is key to Scotland's future tourism, but it is neither the A9 nor the A96. It is Kenya Street and the community spirit, solidarity and culture of welcome that that represents. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Christine Graham, who is the final speaker in the open debate. Again, a strict four minutes. Uh, Ms Graham. Uh, thank you. Uh, you don't have to be a Borders MSP to realise the significance of tourism and related benefits to local retail and the transport sector, but it helps. In my constituency, you can trip over the many tourist destinations. There are so many, from the large Melrose Abbey, Abbotsford and the Great Tapestry of Scotland and Gala Shields, the Mining Museum of Scotland in Newton Grange, with its exhibition in Parliament today, to the small, the Tremontium Museum, it's all about the Romans, again in Melrose, and the diminutive paper-making museum in Pennycook, where you actually can make paper. Financial support in form of Scottish Government grants stretches across the sectors. The Great Tapestry had almost £7 million committed to the project from the Scottish Government's Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, Borders Railway Blueprint Programme and the Borders Council. Tramontia most recently received 400,000 via South of Scotland Enterprise, which itself is funded by the Scottish Government. I visited it just on Monday to enjoy the newly funded high-spec extension already used for educational purposes. Newton Grange Mining Museum also recently received further funding through the 1 million allocated museums, as did Abbotsford. So there is continuing support for landmark attractions. You also have to factor in the support to public transport, the Borders Railway, the extended concessionary fare scheme and support for ScotRail, and of course the funding put in to support the transport and hospitality sectors and other businesses during COVID. During COVID, for example, funding of £129 million was provided to the sector in response to the immediate recommendations of the Scottish Tourism Recovery Task Force. Indeed, I commend local businesses during that period, some of which did receive COVID funding and some which did not. In Peebles, the Tontine Hotel, an iconic building at the end of Peebles High Street, secured not insubstantial funding through South of Scotland Enterprise. Again, that's government funding. Stobo Castle Health Spa near Peebles received COVID support, but the proprietor also took the opportunity with no guests to refurbish and redecorate as did the modest central bar, a free house in Peebles, which didn't qualify for COVID support. But again, the owner updated the decor with inside and out, and out looks just bra. One of the real difficulties for hospitality now, and indeed contributing at one time to a shortage of bus drivers in the borders, and raised time and time again with me, is lack of staff since Brexit. Adding inflation on all fronts, food, fuel, any building works, for example, and it still remains tough, no matter what support the Scottish Government gives. Indeed, the UK is set to one of the highest rates of inflation in the G20, according to today's release from the OECD. But part of the solution is in our hands. If you can, even in these austere times, try a holiday or a wee break at home, or simply visit and explore your own town or country, you'll surprise yourself and you'll certainly help the local economy and support the businesses locally which deserve it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. We now move to closing speeches. I call on Jackie Bailey again a strict four minutes, Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to close the debate for the Scottish Labour Party, not least because the area that I represent is amongst the most beautiful in Scotland, attracting tourists and visitors who come from near and far. And tourism matters enormously to the local and national economy. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the more than 3 million visitors and spending of more than £3 billion. You only need to spend a few minutes in Luss in my constituency to see the army of visitors from America, China, Europe, the rest of the UK, all spending money on accommodation, on food and drink, on entertainment and indeed on souvenirs to take home. And that value is growing again after the difficult years of the pandemic with increased numbers of visitors returning to Loch Lomond and indeed that's happening again across Scotland. It is such a joy to hear all the different accents and languages as you venture down the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. But is government doing enough to capitalise on the opportunity that tourism presents for Scotland? This afternoon has demonstrated areas of concern but also there is much that we can agree on. 
There is, however, a real problem for the government with implementation. And this is a problem that is not confined to this area of debate today. We have a plethora of legislation and policy that is all very worthy, but implementation is poor and the unintended consequences are legion. Let me illustrate that by talking about short-term lets. Remember, this is the legislation that the Scottish Government have already delayed by six months to allow for dialogue with the sector so that problems and concerns could be ironed out. And we welcome that. There's been lots of chat, there's been industry working groups, but presiding officer, not one single change has been made and there are 81 days to implementation. In that time, all self-catering accommodation, B&Bs and others, need to apply to their local authority for a licence. Local authorities are struggling and there is no consistency, but actually that's not their fault. It appears that the government have failed to provide any guidance whatsoever, promised for the 12th of May, but not delivered. Let me tell you about the problem in Argyll and Butte. There are some 8,000 to 10,000 self-catering units across the area, including B&Bs, including yurts, including glamping pods, home shares, the lot. 2,354 are paying non-domestic rates. So far, 427 have applied, but only 53 licenses have been granted. Out of more than 8,000, and we've got 81 days to go. There is no chance of having these licenses in time. Across Scotland, I understand 20% have applied and 2% have received licenses. Self-catering units and local authorities face an impossible task, all because the SNP government don't think about implementation. In a plethora of suggested changes, such as local authorities being able to issue provisional licenses to enable new investment in new provision, has any of that been taken forward? Any of it? Just one thing? Not one presiding officer. This disappointing position confirmed to the Association of Scotland Self-Caterers in a letter from the Minister, Paul McLennan, yesterday. So there you have it. The SNP government are deaf to the needs of business, incompetent at the practical implementation, and they charge on regardless. Unfortunately, this is a hallmark of the SNP's approach to government, but with profound consequences for the tourism sector in Scotland. Presiding officer, I agree with much of what Daniel Johnson, Willie Rennie and Carol Mocken had to say. We need to make much more of the opportunity and potential of tourism. We need to invest in Brand Scotland. But where are the new flights, the ferries to get visitors to our beautiful islands and roads like the A82, A83, A9 and A96? And as Willie Rennie said, where are the toilets? Presiding officer, to we have amazing natural assets, but this SNP government need to do more to positively harness and support the opportunity for the sector to grow. Thank you. I now call on Tom Arthur to close for the uh, Government Minister for uh, a tight five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and can I thank members for their contribution, and indeed thank Liz Smith for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. Um, regardless of the particular views we may have in a political context, I think we would all recognise that Scotland has so much to be proud of for our tourism sector, and I want to put on record my thanks yep. to all those working across our tourism Absolutely. sector for the jobs they create, for the economic contribution they make, and for the opportunities they create for so many people. And we have seen from the significant recovery post-pandemic just how resilient the sector is. And I think we do have that shared ambition to see a flourishing tourist, tourist, tourism sector for all of Scotland, and particularly recognising the contribution tourism makes to our wider economies, whether that is helping to populate our city and town centres, supporting wider retail, hospitality and leisure offering, or perhaps providing jobs and economic activity in some of our most remote and fragile communities. We all have a shared interest in seeing a flourishing tourism sector in Scotland. And we are committed in government to doing all that we can to ensure that we support our tourism sector. Sector. Now, I want to turn to the points that have been raised, a substantive point around regulation. This is something that the Scottish Government has recognised. The First Minister has been clear on that, the Cabinet Secretary has been clear on that, and I would want to assure Mr McKee we are continuing to take forward the work of the Joint Task Force on regulation, and that is forming part of the New Deal. Yeah. It is integrated into that process, and it is a key priority. And implementation is absolutely key. Yes, certainly, very briefly. Willie Rennie. That, that's all fine, but what does he think about public toilets? Minister. 
He sets me up nicely, I think, and incredibly important. And I recognise there's some chuckles, but he makes a very serious point, the member, and it is something. Now, I recognise this is a local government responsibility. And one of the things that we're committed to doing is providing a discretionary power for local government to implement, should they wish, to generate additional revenue to invest yeah. in their local visitor economies. And that is exactly what the visitor levy bill will, um, will deliver if passed by Parliament. And I want to welcome the support it has received from the Labour Party. I want to welcome the close collaboration we've had with industry, yeah. with COSLA, and also to recognise the positive comments made from the Scottish Tourism Alliance, recognising the approach we are taking through, asking Visit Scotland to establish that expert group to yep. ensure we have the best guidance and the best implementation, and also to highlight the comments that STA made, which is that we should be looking at the visitor levy as something that can be, and I quote, a force for good. Yes. Visitor levies are commonplace across Europe, and they do provide an opportunity to generate additional revenue, and the way that revenue will be deployed will ultimately be for local authorities to determine, but it will be a result of consultation and collaboration with businesses, with their communities. I would ask all members to engage constructively, including those who may have an in-principle opposition to a visitor levy. My door is open to constructive engagement because it is absolutely vital that we get this right. No, certainly. Lord Fraser. Well, the Minister for giving way. On this issue of taxation, he rightly, as Minister for Public Finance, challenges us and other parties when we call for reductions in taxation. I notice that the uh, amendment from his colleague talks about cuts in VAT. So can I ask him, how much would he cut VAT by? Uh, how would that be funded and what would the total cost be? Minister, I can give you some of that. Well, of course, back. one of the benefits of the UK government has that the Scottish Government doesn't, is it can go to the Debt Management Office, yes. it can sell guilt. Well, yeah. yes, but if you operate that within a macroeconomic framework of fiscal I recognise that fiscal sustainability might be an alien concept yes. to the Conservatives yeah, exactly. following the mini-budget, yeah. yeah. but I think there's an opportunity yeah. there. It, it, it does, the Member does raise... The, the member Minister, does raise, Minister, the member Minister does, could you resume your seat a second? Look, I know tight is, uh, time is tight. Interventions haven't been possible in every instance, but the Minister has taken a couple of interventions, so could we stop heckling from a sedentary position, Minister? Well, I think there's an importance in recognising specifically it's, it's a call from industry, yeah. but there is that flexibility that the UK government has, which devolved administrations don't have around borrowing. It is that opportunity to use that tax cut to stimulate investment. That is not an option we have within the confines of the fiscal framework, and I think any reasonable member assessing that would realise that I'm afraid I need to make progress. I've only got a few minutes left. Um, Maggie Chapman touched on a lot of points um, with, in regards to um, her contribution. But I think one of the things she touched on is the importance of tourism to communities. And that's one of the things that we have to be absolutely um, focused on, is ensuring that our small businesses, which make up so much of our tourism sector, continue to benefit from that, that jobs and the revenue generated from so much of our tourism economy is used to support the resilience of our local and regional economies. I'm going to have to draw my remarks to a conclusion, but I would want to touch on the points that Keith Brown made, and that is ultimately the recognition that in so many of the kind of key levers which can d dictate and, and, and shape the macroeconomic environment in which we operate, they do rest with the UK government, and many of the challenges we face, particularly around, around labour shortages, can only be fundamentally addressed by the UK government. But I want to work in partnership, I want to engage to ensure that we can continue to see a thriving tourism sector for all of Scotland. Well said. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I now call on Murdo Fraser to wind up the debate again a tight six minutes. Mr Fraser. Thank you, uh, Battalion Officer. Well, this has been a, a wide-ranging and actually quite constructive debate. We've had Willie Rennie bursting for the toilet, Rachel Hamilton trying to sell us a camper van, and Maggie Chapman, as usual, wired to the moon and on a different planet <laughs> uh, from the rest of us. But what we've heard uh, throughout this debate, Presiding Officer, is that the tourist industry is one of the keystones of the Scottish economy. It generates billions of pounds of revenue and employs hundreds of thousands of people. Scotland has a great tourist product, attracting visitors from all across the world. And yet, as we've heard, the mood in the sector at present is dark. A whole range of challenges face an industry overwhelmingly made up of small and medium-sized businesses, as Liz Smith reminded us. And just as the sector is seeking to recover from COVID, it's been hit with a list of problems, many of which come back to the door of this Scottish Government. And against that backdrop, it's astonishing that Hamza Youssef, when he became First Minister, decided there would no longer be a minister in his government given the title of Minister for Tourism. Yes, there's space for a dedicated Minister for Independence, but tourism doesn't get a mention. 
and what a signal that sends to the sector about its importance to this government. Now, let me address some of the challenges that have been raised during the debate. A number of members quite rightly raised workforce issues and the problems that the sector has in attracting staff. And it's true, many businesses struggle to get staff. They have to operate in shortened hours or even turn away trade because they cannot find the people to fill the vacancies. Now, people on the SNP benches seem to blame this entirely on Brexit. But the facts are much more complex than that because every other Western economy is today facing workforce issues. Yep. When I visited Germany last summer with a range of colleagues from across the parties in this parliament, the number one concern from German businesses, apart from uh, the cost of energy, was the lack of availability of labour. It's the same in France, it's the same in Italy, and the same in elsewhere. It cannot be Brexit causing these issues yep. in other European countries. It must be something else. And we see, according to the latest figures, Net immigration, yes, I'll give way. Cabinet yeah. Secretary. One of the areas that, of course, we uh, could improve upon alongside uh, the work that we're bringing forward on uh, a talent attraction and migration service would be if the UK Government would accept our proposal for a rural visa pilot. Will Murdo Fraser back that call today? Well, Mr. See, Fraser. You see, you see, the problem with the approach being taken by the Minister is that net immigration into the UK today is double what it was prior to Brexit. It's at record levels. The question for the Cabinet Secretary is why are these migrants coming into the UK not coming to Scotland? What is it about Scotland under this SNP government that is not attracting them? I don't, sorry, I don't have time, Mr McKee. So we do need to look at other ways of attracting people into the tourist sector. My colleague Maurice Golden hosted an, an excellent event in Parliament last week highlighting the work of the charity Only a Pavement Away, which is about attracting those into the hospitality sector who are prison leavers, who are homeless, or who otherwise come from difficult backgrounds. It was an inspiring event with some real success stories. And I've seen for myself successes of apprenticeship schemes run by businesses such as Creef Hydro, offering younger people secure and rewarding careers in the sector. There's much more to be done in this area, but it's right to highlight a key concern about the need to encourage more young people into a rewarding and long-term career. Now, we've heard about the issue of business rates paid by the sector. South of the border, they've been given a 75% relief for the current year, but despite having the barnet consequentials from this, the Scottish Government has made different choices. And yet the rates burden is one of the major issues raised yeah. by the sector, and it's entirely within the gift of the Scottish Government to do something about this. And on the question of tax, I was frankly astonished that the Minister for Public Finance seemed to be arguing that the government, UK government should increase borrowing to fund tax cuts. That's exactly what they criticised Liz Truss and Quasi Quartang did when they were in government. And now they're advocating it as a policy the government should follow, presiding officer. And then we have a number of members talked about the licensing scheme for short-term lengths. And I was encouraged, but there seemed to be a broad reflection across the chamber from all different parties that this was causing real issues. And Jackie Bailey gave us the figures for our guide on Butte, which are really worrying. And I really would urge the government to look at this again, look at whether something might be done with a new intervention in this area. Otherwise, we're going to see businesses unable to operate because local authorities cannot pros process the applications fast enough to allow them to continue. And we see the same impact from connectivity issues. Just last week, I was talking to a hotelier uh, in here telling me about the difficulties hotels in the islands have in attracting bookings with the ongoing uncertainty over the ferry services. As Willie Rennie and others said, we saw a huge public protest in Loch Boysdale in South Uist last week, highlighting the fact that for the month of June they will see a massive disruption to the ferry service there. That is doing real damage yep. to the tourist industry in the Highlands and Islands right now, and it is something that comes back under the watch of this Scottish Government. And we are still waiting for a programme for completing the duelling of the A9 and the A96. Again, uh, long-awaited and long-delayed promises from the, this SNP government. And just two weeks ago, we saw yet another fatality on the A9, on the Tomat and Tomoy section, yep. the section that was supposed to have work started on by now, and yet somebody lost his life. That needs to change, presiding officer. So, presiding officer, all these issues I've talked about are within the gift of this Scottish government to resolve. People across the sector are crying out for Scottish Government support, but instead its major initiative is what? It's a new tourist tax, taking yet more money out of a sector already hard-pressed. As Edward Mountain said, if the Scottish Government doesn't change its approach, it's in danger of killing the goose 
that laid the golden egg. We all want to see a thriving tourism sector. We will only have that if the government recognises that this industry, made up of mostly smaller operators, is encouraged and supported. So instead of focusing on independence, it is supporting tourism. That should be this government's priority, and I have pleasure in supporting the motion in the name of my colleague Liz Smith. Thank you. Point of order, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I ask for the Presiding Officer's guidance uh, on the comments made by Murdo Fraser a few moments ago. I'm probably one of the oldest uh, MSPs in the Chamber, and in my 40-year working career, including 31 years as a police officer, I can honestly say I've never heard such a display of inappropriate behaviour and yeah. entitlement. Yeah. And so I ask the presiding officer for your guidance on any appropriate action. Thank you. Um, I have just assumed the chair and I'm not wholly um, clear with regards to the member's comments. It is obviously the case that members' contributions are not generally a matter for the chair, they are a matter for the member themselves. Um, of course, where any inaccuracy has been made, a correction mechanism exists. Um, and I will move on to the next item of business. Point of order, Christina McKell. An officer, um, on a point of order, can you advise the Chamber on the opportunities a member may have to apologise for using harmful, ableist tropes used to ridicule people with mental health issues? In his summing up, Murdo Fraser used the trope where um, wired to the moon to describe our Green colleague Maggie Chapman. I find it wholly inappropriate and it should have been dealt with when he said it. Um, thank Ms McKelvey for her point of order. I will look into this matter and I will be back in touch with, with the member in due course. Now, the debate on prioritising Scottish tourism is concluded and we move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 9361 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. Over here, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion, and the question is that motion 9361 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9362 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on a stage one timetable. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now, and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 9362 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 9363 on approval of an SSI. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. I move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, and there are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Neil Gray is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Sarah Boyack will fall? And the first question is that Amendment 9339.3, in the name of Neil Gray, which seeks to amend Motion 9339, in the name of Liam Kerr, on a thriving future for Scotland's oil and gas sector and its workers, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.